people want to say no because it makes us feel safer. So if a brand wants to say no, go ahead and like get that out of the gate first. Let them say no. And what I say about this is that like if you have an ask, you want to make sure that you have other asks in your arsenal. So you're not just coming out the gate with only one option that you're pitching. You want to have these other ideas that you could potentially collaborate with the brand on. That way, if they say no, okay, great. We've got the no out of the way. Now let's get to the yes. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Julie, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Ah, thank you for having me, Hala. It's great to be with you. I think this is going to be an awesome conversation. I think you're going to share things that my listeners are just going to love. And so for those who don't know you, you're a former publicist, blogger, marketing expert, podcaster, and now most recently, you are going to be the author of a new book, Get What You Want, that's coming out in June. And I can't wait to get into your pitching strategies. But first, I wanted to talk about your journey. Uh, You grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. You had blue collar parents. They taught you the value of hard work. You graduated with a degree in marketing and PR, and then you went straight for the gold. You wanted to go to New York and get a job in PR, which is really hard to do straight out of college, uh, but you did it. So talk to us about that and, and how you managed to do that. Yeah, you know, as you mentioned, I'm from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, actually originally from a really small, small, small town in Tennessee and come from just a very blue collar working family, didn't have a lot growing up. Um my parents divorced when I was young and I moved to Nashville and, and so I went to, went to school there and then went to college. Um, and then, like you said, it was two months before I graduated college. I'd never been to New York city and I go to New York on a journalism trip with my college and I get there and I'm like, I'm moving here. Like this is where I'm supposed to be. And so I come home and I had thought that I was going to, go to LA or maybe go back to Nashville. Like New York was not in my zeitgeist at all, but I come back home and I'm like, I'm going to New York. And so I start um, taking meetings. And as you know, if you don't really live there, no one's going to take you seriously. So I, I had a friend of a friend that lived there and let me fake use her address. So I put on my resume that I was there (laughs) when I wasn't there And um, I remember one time I was doing some calls on the phone and I didn't want to admit that I wasn't there yet, you know, so I was like, oh, I'm out of town. I'll be there in a couple of weeks, just totally faking it until I made it. And I remember one time um, I because I worked all through college. And so there's there was this PR company that wanted me to interview like the next day. So I bought a ticket that was like $400, flew up there in the morning, took the meeting and flew home that night. Like I was determined to get a job and I still didn't get a job. So this was like May. So I graduate college and I just, I, three weeks later, I, I moved there and I had no place to live. I had no job. I had no friends. I had some friends of a friend. So I started like surfing on people's couches and like doing the thing and spent that summer just trying to get a job. And, you know, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any kind of connection. So I had to start getting kind of scrappy. And one of the things I knew that I wanted to get into music PR. And at this time, this was 2007. So this is still kind of that traditional PR landscape and it's back it was before Facebook was around and and Twitter wasn't even around yet it was just Facebook Um, and really the only there was no way to get contacts there there used to be this huge database called Cision and that was like the only way you could get contacts and it was like 30 grand a year to Mm. like uh, to subscribe to I think it's still around but it was really hard to get to get contacts. So mm. the one thing that I knew though, it was like the, the one thing that I took from college, Hala, was that I knew in one of my PR classes, I had to learn how to write a press release. And on every single press release, there is a PR contact on it and always at the bottom. And the other thing that a press release always has is this saying at the top that says for immediate release. And this basically allows the media know that what you are sharing with them is for immediate release. You don't have to hold the information. Mm. So I started Googling 
in parentheses for immediate release. And then I pulled up the Billboard Hot 100 list and I just started going down every single music act. So I would do for immediate release, Pink, for immediate release, Lenny Kravitz, for immediate release, and just started going down, just hoping that like maybe their publicist contact would pop up on Google. And luckily some of them did. And so I sent out like 35 pitches like hey I don't know if you're hiring but if you are like I'm here and I started to interview with a lot of people and um ended up snagging an interview with a company called 42 West that they represent like really top film and, and TV stars and then interviewed with a company called Press Here Publicity and they rep some of the top music acts at the time mm. and that is who I ended up getting my first job with. I went into Press Here and one of the top publicists there, Carlene Donovan, was looking for an assistant and she repped Lenny Kravitz, the Bob Marley estate, Mackay Pfeiffer, Most Deaf, uh, Pink, Maroon 5, Def Leppard, um, Stone Temple Pilots. I mean, she wrapped wow. so many big names back then. And so I was just this young 21-year-old girl that had never been to the city that now had this opportunity after a couple of months of just like sending out my resume. I finally got the job. I was making $20,000 a year with, with you know, about $35,000 <laughs> in student loan debt. I found an apartment. I found this random person that I had never met to live with me. It was a one bedroom that we converted into a two bedroom so we could actually afford it. And and I just started going to work and kind of similar to you, Hala, like I got to do some really amazing things. I mean, I was front row at Fashion Week. I was going to the Grammys. I was, you know, flying across the country for tour press and tour media. And I, I got to experience and be a part of some really incredible things. And I got to work with some really powerful women doing really big things, but I wasn't making any money. Hmm. And I had to pay my bills. I had, you know, I kept deferring my student loans because I couldn't afford to pay them. And, you know, my business, the work that I got to do would warrant me to be able to get like free dinners and stuff because some nights we would have like a show we would have to go to mm -hmm. and we would go and do a dinner first. But after about a year or so of doing that, I got to a place that I couldn't. I couldn't sustain it anymore. My parents helped me as much as they could, but they told me they were like, look, after a year, like we're out, you've got yeah. to figure this out on your own. And, and so I, I left, I got scared. I didn't know how to figure it out on my own. And so I came home and I went into like a massive depression because that was my dream job. And it was this weird, I'm sure you've been through it where it's like, you, you're like in this different world and this different vortex and then it's like then I was like laying in my parent I was like living with my parents in like my old childhood bedroom like it was oh, just no. so bizarre but the gift of that moment hollow was that I just said to myself I was like I will never freaking feel this way again and I will never give up on a dream ever again so clearly that wasn't for me and a lot more happened from that um, that we can talk about. But the gift of New York, it showed me the grit that I had, the ability to think outside the box, my resilience. You know, I learned more in one year than some people learn in a decade working mm -hmm. in that environment. And it really kicked off the confidence that I needed to then go to the next stages that really ended up creating the business that I have today. Yeah, this is such an inspiring story. First of all, I want to call out like, wow, do we have it easy in 2022 in terms of getting contacts? Like you just plug in an extension, you're downloading emails off LinkedIn. Yep. It's so much easier now. And so kudos to you for doing it when you were just a kid in 2007 when the resources weren't there. Yeah. And to everybody out there listening, when you were talking, I was like, I think your strategy could still work, honestly. It does still work. Yeah, I <laughs> teach it. I teach it to students and clients all the time. I mean, press yeah. releases still go out. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm about to tell my guest outreach leads, like, here's a hot tip from Julie. So so that's a good one. But for my, I didn't know that you actually had this this whole blip in your career where you w moved back to your parents' house. I thought it was just straight to HarperCollins. And how, how did you move up in the corporate world? Because I know you eventually did that and then started basically a side hustle. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So I, you know, I went back home. It was in the summer. And again, I found myself like no job <laughs> back at home where I did not want to be. 
just kind of fell into this quarter life crisis of like, who I, who am I? What am I doing? I broke up with my boyfriend at the time. You know, there was this other guy that I had started to see in New York that I had left. You know, it was just like, I didn't have anybody. <laughs> and so I, I had to just to kind of take this inventory that summer. And I remember it being like me just kind of running away from things. Um, and, and just trying to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, but I, I knew that I needed something stable. I needed to have some kind of stable job. I needed to start paying off my student loans because I had been deferring them for over a year. Um, and so that's where the corporate mindset came in. So, um, kind of back to the drawing board of applying to different positions. And in Nashville, there was a subsidiary to Harper Collins that is based in Nashville. And, you know, I think just through Indeed and doing some searching and people that I knew um, I like reached out to apply for a job and it and did you know I, I even worked with the film commission with the state of Tennessee for a little while it kind of went through like a couple of years of trying to to navigate and figure out what I wanted to do and then I got I got the corporate gig mm-hmm. and um, but I always had this I was never quite satisfied. Like I, I would get done with my work at, in the corporate, you know, in my cubicle really quickly. And then like on the side, I started working with, cause at the time EDM music started to become a thing. Mm. And I had a friend who was an agent who worked with a lot of DJs. And so I started to do some side hustle publicity, music publicity for these DJs that were going to all of these music festivals. And this is before, I mean, this was back when Ultra Fest in Miami was called winter music conference like Mm. it was just it was right when that whole world of like the dj festival stuff started to blow up so i was doing that on the side and then i got into the book pr thing um and then i did that for about two years and then like that itch that itch to really go out on my own kind of came back in and so i left harper collins and me and another woman that used to work there joined forces and we Mm -hmm just started basically being freelance publicists. And so we started working, then HarperCollins hired us. And so we started doing the book campaigns. Um, And I knew that was possible because when I was in house at the publishing house, you know, I was the one hiring these publicists and I was I was like mm. oh my gosh they're making like five six seven grand a month like and I'm sitting in this cubicle like and they have freedom and they don't have to like wear this Ann Taylor suit and come into this office like <laughs> you know I just I kept I kept seeing what was possible and I think that even if I didn't truly have the confidence to even know what that was at the time if it was possible for them I knew it had to be possible for me because it's possible for other other people so that that gave me the courage to just kind of like roll the dice again and be like I quit I'm going out on my own and then and then that's what that was kind of the the corporate gift and then what brought me into doing my own freelance work and so I'd love to understand how you became an influencer, because from my understanding, you have a blog and you you at least had a blog at some point. So how did you how did you, you know, dabble into being an influencer? Because at that time, there was no such thing really as an influencer. That wasn't really a thing. Yeah. So about this time, it is like 2011, 2012. And I have left. It's 2012. I've left corporate. I'm now I'm now I'm now a con- you know, pub- publicity consultant and and they're hiring me to basically do what I was doing in house. Mm-hmm. And and it was good, but I was just like always kind of wanting something more. It was fun, but this was also around the time, Hala, that I could I could start to see that the landscape of publicity was changing and it was changing fast. And you know, just that traditional landscape was it, it was getting skewed. And now at this time, you know, Twitter exists. Instagram exists, these people called bloggers started to kind of come out of the woodwork. And then personally, what was happening in my life at the time is that I had met my now husband and he lived in Los Angeles. And so we were doing this back and forth thing. And we kind of got to this point where it was like, what are we doing? And so since I had been freelancing and I wasn't working in corporate America anymore, it gave me this freedom to move. So I pack up my bags and I move to LA and move in with him. And, and it was the beginning of 2013. And I find myself in LA barefoot and pregnant because we got pregnant very quickly with my first (laughs) child. And again, it's kind of like New York, like 
don't know many people here, knew some from my connections, but don't know many people here. My husband work requires him to like travel a lot because he's an actor. So he's always gone on set. So I'm home alone. I don't know many people. And it was at the time that this idea of blogging was becoming a thing and influencer marketing was becoming a thing in LA has always been the top 1% of the top 1% of those people. Like Mm -hmm. all of the content creators and bloggers that were really doing big things were coming out of LA. And so it was the timing of being there and seeing like this new way of marketing that was interesting to me. And I was like, well, maybe I could dabble in this. It gives me a different creative outlet. I've been doing this consulting you know, book PR thing for a couple of years now. I'm kind of getting tired of it. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing that. And I started to reach out to some people that I knew from my New York days just to be like, hey, I live in LA now. I don't know anybody here. Do you know anyone that you can connect me with? And and I did. I had some some friends connect me with some of their friends. And um and another good friend of mine, Angela, had started a YouTube channel at the time. She was a glam YouTuber. And she was like, you should get into blogging. I think that it will allow you to be able to network and I'll take you to some of these events that I'm going to. And so I started blogging on the side and I started to kind of notice when we would go to these events, it was like all of these influencers and bloggers would just be like sitting in the corner of this event, just like doing this. But then like all of the brand reps who made the deals and had the money were like over here. And I'm thinking to myself, and this is just my my publicist hat, I'm like, why aren't these content creators talking to these brands? Like, I don't understand. Like, they want to work with brands. They want to collaborate with brands. And they're not, they're in, they're at this event. They have this great opportunity to connect and network and to meet these brands. And they're not talking to them. So I just started going up and talking to them. And what I found because of my background and understanding marketing and PR, not only was I able to build these relationships with these brands by going to these events, but I was able to actually to start monetizing my blog really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had not even 5,000 followers at the time and I started out earning what I was making in PR through my blog and content monetization. And that's when I was like, okay, this is interesting. And at the time, I just, I told myself, I was like, if I can just make like $6,000 a month, like that will give me breathing room. Like I can pay my bills. I can pay my credit card debt um, or my my college debt. Um, I can keep the lights on. I can do what I need to do. And it will also give me some breathing room so I don't have to take on certain book clients that I don't want to take on anymore, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm able to facilitate that money over here. And so I started doing that and then, you know, about six months into it, I started to have these friends of mine or these women that I would meet at these events who were big content creators at the time. And, you know, at the time they, they had hundreds of thousands of followers, which is like having millions now. And they mm-hmm. were sitting front row at fashion week and they were doing those things. And they said, you know, Julie, I don't mean to come off rude, but how is it that you have no followers and you're making money and I have hundreds of thousands of followers and I'm making $10 off of a t-shirt. Mm. And then that's what gave me the idea that instead of really being a blogger, I need to start kind of being the the coach and being the consultant and being a, a resource of information and support for these content creators because that's that's really where my expertise was. It wasn't in, mm. people didn't care what outfit I had on. They wanted to know how I was making money. <laughs> so yeah. I listened to that and, and that's really how all of that kind of transitioned and, and where where the where the blogging piece of that came in this is so interesting to me and i resonate with it so much because i was a blogger too around that time right blogging was so hot blogging is like what having a podcast is like now i feel like it's it's the equivalent or like having a TikTok channel or something like that because social media like you said people didn't have millions of followers like the big social you, you'd have five thousand people and you were an influencer like people thought you were a hot ch- i used to have like seven thousand people on twitter and everybody thought i was famous like oh yeah it was a whole different world back then right so it was just a different world and i look at myself now and like I make so much money off my podcast and I'm punching way above my weight, but it's because I understand the business. I understand how to make money off of every single download and squeeze it. You know what I mean? And the thing is that there's a lot of influencers out there. They have no idea how to capture the money that they deserve. And I think that this is 
really needed right now because there's not that many people teaching influencers how they can actually make money. And a lot of people think they need th hundreds of thousands, millions of followers, millions of views in order to get sponsored. But that's definitely not the case, especially now when micro influencers are so hot. So I love this. So let's 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 dig into how you came up with some of your first creative strategies to get placements. So I found out that you got into People Magazine very early on and you were somehow able to finagle getting your whole house remodeled and you got featured in People Magazine. So talk to us about how you did that and how we can do similar strategies. Yeah, so this was 20 probably 14, 2015, something like that. And again, I, I, I never was the content creator or the, the girl that had all the followers. I, I was never the person that was, had the perfectly curated Instagram feed. I was never the, the one that just, you know, the fashion sense like naturally came to her. I was never the one that was being invited on the front row of fashion week. So I really had to work with what I had. And what I had was an understanding of marketing and PR strategy and really an understanding of serving other people because it's not about me. It's about how can I give them what they want? Because mm -hmm. if they get what they want, then I can get what I want and then everybody get what's, gets what they want and everybody's happy. So what I wanted at the time was my son was two years old at the time and we were turning his baby room into like a big boy room. And I wanted to try to figure out a way to partner with a brand, really, so like I didn't, to offset the cost, so I didn't have to pay for it. Um, and I knew it would be a good opportunity for me to work with brands. And this is what I was trying to do and monetize my platform. But, you know, and I started pitching it out to all of these different companies, and they just kept being like, what's in it for us? Like, you have, you know, two followers. Like, why should we care? And so instead of just feeling bad about myself and giving up, I was like, okay, well, I can't change the fact that I don't have a lot of followers, but what, what can I work with? And so I was like, well, why do they want me to have a lot of followers? Why is that important to a brand? Because they see that as them being able to get in front of more people to get more eyes, right? So following is really just a viewership. So I started to think, well, if I don't have a platform that has a viewership, what are other platforms that have a viewership? And I go, well, media. Media have platforms that have viewerships. What relationships do I have? I have media relationships. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I don't have the following. I don't, I don't have, you know, people aren't just knocking at my door begging to work with me. But what I did have was an understanding of how to pitch myself and how to get those relationships. And if I didn't have those relationships, I knew that I could figure out how to find those relationships. Because here's the, the other thing that I want to mention, because I think that it's probably easy for someone to hear this and be like, oh, well, easy for Julie to do it because she was a publicist and she had relationships. Book contacts are completely different than lifestyle and fashion and brand contacts. Like the book contacts that I had, they couldn't help me with any of this. They covered books. The music contacts that I had, they couldn't help me with this. And really by this by this stage, and you know this, Hala, I had lost a lot of those relationships. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in the media landscape, those relationships, I mean, those people are changing jobs every single day. So somebody that I might have known at People Magazine five years ago, they're not even there anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it. I really was starting from from this from the bottom but what I knew was was how if I didn't know that relationship I knew that I could figure out how to get to that relationship mm -hmm. and so um so I just started thinking I was like well if they're wanting to get in front of people if that's really the goal for them the goal is not that I have followers the goal is that they get new eyes on what they want so maybe I could get them media and if I could basically act as their publicist and get them media then maybe they would want to work with me so then I started to switch gears and instead of pitching the brands I started pitching the media companies and so you know and at the time because of blogging I had been just trying to get my name out there so I would always offer to do like contributing posts and editorials and op-eds and stuff like that just to get tagged and get my name out there so I went to you know modern mom and mom.me and just all of these mom sites pop sugar moms and these mom blogger sites at the time that covered a lot of mom content because again I was working on my son's room and this was a this was a mom related piece of content um and then i noticed during my research that 
People Magazine was coming out with their own blog. They were going to have a blog on people.com and they were going to have like a parenting section. Mm. So I got scrappy, figured, you know, found a bunch of different contacts, just reached out to all of them. And I was just asking, would you guys, would you guys be interested in, in a piece of this kind of home makeover, stay at home, work from home mom, home makeover, if I were to partner with a brand? And so they were like, cool, like, sure, we need content. That's the thing. Media always needs content. So they were like, mm -hmm. awesome, no big deal. You know, they're like, for starting this new thing, we would love content. So I was like, awesome. Now I can go back to the brand and say, hey, People Magazine is interested in covering the story. Are you in or are you, are you out? And so I went back to the brands and f after, you know, 15,000 different brands I went to, I was able to narrow it down. And then finally one, all you need is one, one brand got back to me and that was World Market. And they said, we would love to do this. If, we, if, you, can, if you can guarantee that we're going to get media, we would love to do this. So then I paused and I put my PR hat back on and I was like, okay, so how can I make this as big as freaking possible? Because this <laughs> is my only chance at this. So like, how can I make this big? So I went back to People Magazine and I said, world market is in, but they're wondering, is, is there any possibility that we could also get a print opportunity? And they were like, well, if we're gonna do print, we need to have this be just more than like one room. We need to see like a makeover transformation. So then I was like, okay. So then I went back to World Market and I said, okay, so guys, the only way that People Magazine is going to be able to do this is if you redo my entire house because they need to see a full home renovation. And if you can do that, then we'll be able to not only get the blog coverage with links clicked, so then World Market's making money because people can click on those links, but then we're also getting a .com feature and you're getting an imprint feature, which is just good for awareness. And yeah. they were like, cool, let's do it. And so I was able to then get like over $250,000 worth of furniture and interior design services and photography f services all included in this deal. And that was really like the first, that was at the very beginning of all of this and one of the first things that I ever did. And so from that, when friends and people kind of caught wind to this, because this was back when like people, girls like me that were doing this, they weren't thinking like that. They, they mm -hmm. weren't thinking like that you that that was possible. And so then just so many women and girls that were in that content creation space just started coming to me and they were like, how, how do I do, te help me do this, I wanna do that. And that's when I created my first course, which is still around today called Pitch It Perfect. And it helps content creators learn how to pitch and land brand deals. This is amazing. I love the way that you think. I feel like we think really similar. And so I kinda wanna like piece this apart at a high level because it's just so interesting. So basically what you're doing is you're finding an opportunity. You're like matching two people together and then inserting yourself, basically. I'd love for you to like just just explain how you can do this over and over. Like you've done this dozens and dozens of times, right? So oh, I mean, yeah, hundreds. What, what is the formula to do this? What I call it the spotlight method. So the, the biggest challenge that people face when they come into this, and you, you actually already touched on some objectives. People think that they need to have a million followers. People think that they need to look a different way or act a different way or anything they just need to think a different way that's it mm. and you can teach someone how to think a different way so th that's kind of the first objection but we can get over that the second issue that I have seen and again like I've been I I had the first pitch course out of its kind ever I mean this was back in 2016 people weren't talking about this people weren't doing this if content creators were working with brands they were catching the deals no one was pitching themselves and so I have I have seen it all and I have been on all different facets of this and and what I share in the course is what I call the spotlight method. So the biggest issue that I see people have is that when they go to work with a brand or to essentially pitch themselves, they make it about themselves instead of about the brand. It's all about like what I want, what can you do for me, how much money I want to make, you know, how I want this to look, how's it going to help my following, instead of fo focusing on I, it's not about me, it's about them. I am a so solution provider for what it is that they want. So it's about taking the spotlight off of you and putting the spotlight on the brand and really remembering that at the end of the day, it's always about people first. 
on the other end of that email, on the other end of that brand is an actual human being that has wants, that has needs, that has desires, that has a boss that is wanting to make sure that they hit their goals and their targets. So if you can make that person's life easier, if you can help that person do a good job for their company and their boss, they are gonna wanna work with you time and time and time and time again and happily pay you for that. So I teach people this idea of the spotlight method and how and how to approach brands in a way that is not self-serving, but is solutions-based first and really making it about supporting the brand first. And it's it's, it's funny, I, I have, you know, a lot of relationships now in, in that brand space. And about two years into this, I think it was like 2018, a friend of mine was like, Julie, it's so it's so funny now, because when a content creator pitches us, if she pitches us a certain way, we know that she's come from your Pitch It Perfect program because of the way that she knows <laughs> she knows how to talk to us because she's learned your formula. You've coached her. She knows how to do it. So they could always they call them like the Pip Girls. They could always tell if it was like a Pip Girl because thousands of incredible women have gone through that course now. So they could they could always tell that. And so and I think that that. You know, when something like that becomes so proven in the marketplace, when you have brands that are able to identify that way of working, you know that it works. That's when you know that something is proven and tried and true in a marketplace. I'm, I'm very excited, honestly. I think I'm going to put my whole sales th team through your pitch it course because we, we do sales for influencers. We have a podcast network now. Um, so I'm going to have them go through that. Now, there's a lot of people out there. They've got expertise. You know, they're very smart, they're very credentialed, they're very talented, but they feel like they're not good enough to get PR. They feel like they're not big enough, it will never happen. Talk to us about the fears and some of the misconceptions when it comes to PR and publicity. Yeah, I mean, so the first one is the following. And, you know, and I always say this, that, you know, it's, or people, you know, people are like, I'm not, I'm not big enough or I'm not, I don't have enough followers. And it's kind of that idea of, like, what do you think gets you the followers? Like, it, it's it's not just creating content and then someone just bestowing a bunch of followers on you. It's brand awareness that gets you the followers. It's creating quality content that people want to see and actively engage in. Now, you know, Instagram today is way different than Instagram, you know, a few years ago. It's, it's not really, I don't even really see Instagram as being a place where you can grow. It's more of a brand awareness tool. It's really hard mm -hmm. to grow on Instagram now. You can still on, you know, TikTok and, and I, other I 100% agree. There's no organic growth. Yeah, there's no organic growth there. But at the time, there was. And if you would align with a brand who then is promoting you on their page, your likelihood of growing is going to be tenfold. And so that's what I always say to people is like, well, how do you, it's kind of like you're saying, I want to go, I want to go major in chemistry, but I've never taken a class, so I can't major in chemistry. It's like, well, what do you think gets you the major? taking the class, going to the classes, learning how to do it, actually testing things out. And so that's a big misconception. Another one I think is people will say, well, I've tried pitching and it didn't work, you know, so it just clearly it doesn't work. And my thought is like, yeah, but I mean, that's like saying, hey, I, I tried to walk when I was two years old and I fell down. So walking doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I tried to swim and, you know, once and, and, and you know couldn't figure it out so swimming doesn't work or you know I I tried to drive when I was 16 years old and I didn't do it perfectly so driving doesn't work it's like no it's not mm -hmm. that it doesn't work you just haven't nothing's going to work perfect the first time you have to learn how to do something over and over and over again um, so that's another big misconception is people will, will try it once and then they'll just like vote it off the island um, and then I, I think another really big misconception is um the idea that they have to get all of these ducks in a row first before it's like, well, I need the followers and then I need to do this and then I need to do this and then I need to do this and then the brands will be ready to work with me. And it's like, no, it's it's not the brand's job to come and find you. It's your job to go to the brands. And I think that that's the other thing that a lot of people just feel like they have to become a certain type of influencer. And then once they become that, these brands just start knocking on your door. And that may be the case for some of those influencers. But for most of the micro influencers who are actually making the majority of the money, that is not the case at all. Um, and then another another challenge that I see people um, go through, and it kind of goes back to that idea of like pitching doesn't work. The, 
it's somebody that's never pitched before and they'll try to go off and pitch like to Chanel. <laughs> you know, they've got like 4,000 followers. They don't wear Chanel, but they're like pitching to Chanel. And it's like, let, let's actually build out what a realistic plan for you is. And like, don't you think it's, you're, you're going to be setting yourself up for success if you actually pitch and land and monetize a lot of small brand deals first before after like there's nothing wrong with having that pie in the sky goal but let's actually work with where you are today and what it is that you have today yeah and I imagine like just matching yourself better with brands I feel like brands would resonate if they feel like you're their target audience and you actually use their stuff right yep absolutely Okay, so something that I want to uncover, um, I thought it was really interesting in your book, you talk about a signature pitch, and you have a very distinct uh, definition, definition of that. You say a signature pitch is a specific opportunity that transfers a belief that a brand must have to say, let me do that again, <laughs> and you have a very distinct definition of what a signature, signature pitch is. You say that a signature pitch is a specific opportunity that transfers, oh my God, this is a tongue twister, let me do this again, Julie, let me just like, shh. <laughs> we'll edit this out obviously okay so in your book you talk about something called a signature pitch and you have a very distinct definition you say that a signature pitch is a specific opportunity that transfers a belief that a brand must have to say yes to you so break that down for us what does that actually mean because it was kind of hard for me to understand it fully yes okay so everyone needs a signature pitch that is unique to their experiences, their expertise, their core beliefs, what they bring to the table. And so that's what I call it as a signature pitch. Your signature pitch hollow may be different from mine. Now the foundations of a pitch and the foundations of selling, I think pretty much remain the same, but it's, it's, everyone has a unique distinction to what that is. And what makes a pitch signature to you is that you have to figure out a way to transfer belief, meaning most of the time people are already psychologically out of the gate wanting to say no to you first. So how do we transfer the belief from the no into this is exactly who we need to work with, where do we sign? And you do that with your signature pitch. And so that's, that's really what I teach of that model is your signature pitch, again, is not about you and what you want. It's how are you transferring that belief that you are the solution provider for what it is that they need, want, or desire that is going to get them to say yes to you. The other thing that I think is an, is an important element to the signature pitch, and I may not even share this in the book but people want to say no because it makes us feel safer mm -hmm. so if a brand wants to say no go ahead and like get that out of the gate first let them say no and what I say about this is that like if you have an ask you want to make sure that you have other asks in your arsenal so you're not just coming out the gate with only one option that you're pitching you want to have these other ideas that you could potentially collaborate with the brand on that way if they say no okay great we've got the no out of the way now let's get to the yes and you can then follow up with these other ideas that you have and so that's really where a signature pitch can come into play and and really having these di these different options and so you're not really it's like you want to get the no because we learn from our no's first off, but also a no is kind of it's it's guaranteed in any kind of negotiating type of situation that's happening. So let's get the no out the gate so then we can get to the good stuff and get them to say yes. And that even goes back to the story that I shared with my, you know, my home renovation. I got a lot of no's. I even got no from the two from People Magazine and from World Market before I got the yes. Does that answer your question? It does, but I'd love to get some examples of like what a signature pitch is. Like what's your signature pitch? Yeah, so I my background is in education. So I'm usually going to be coming from this place of offering some type of solution to an educational based thing. So if I'm going to a brand and like, for example, right now I'm pitching a podcast tour. So I'm going to these brands and I'm using what my signature is, is the education piece to say, I'm going to be on this tour. Or I'm going to be teaching X, Y, and Z. We're going to have X, Y, and Z type of person that is there that is your ideal avatar as well. And I'm going to be using 
my expertise in that education forum to really kick off this event and to make that be what people are coming home with. So that would be the angle that I would take. Other angles that you could take for people, sometimes it's beauty, sometimes it's wellness, sometimes it's health, sometimes it's fashion, it's entertainment, sometimes it's your own products and services. So it's about what is what is signature and unique to you that is going to be able to connect with the brand that the brand is actually going to see value in to get them to say yes to you. Yes. And you talk about three elements, connection, credibility, and promise. Is there anything you want to add to in regards to that? Yeah. So I think connection, and we've talked a lot about that, and this is really where that spotlight method comes into play. You want to be able to authentically connect to the brand and to also what it is that you're offering them. And that's why I always say like, it's it's always people first and coming from that, from that place. I think that that is huge. And credibility. You want to be able to back up what it is that you're saying. It doesn't mean that you need to be necessarily the biggest or best expert in whatever it is, but it's it's about showcasing the things that really make you stand out and really make you shine. So what are those credible pieces? Maybe it's not your following, but maybe it's your newsletter li- mm, list. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's not your email list, but maybe it's, you know, the fact that you're a really good content creator. There's a student in my Pitch It Perfect program right now. Her name is Erden, and she has like no following, but she is this phenomenal content creator, and she creates these incredible TikToks and Reels. So brands are actually hiring her, not for her to put content on her channel, but for her to actually create content for them. So that has become her signature pitch. She is, you know, they're not having to hire this ad agency anymore. They're hiring her. Mm. And so it's about thinking, you know, what can I work with what I have to have that credibility piece shine to light? And then your promise, which is your pit promise, is am I actually going to be able to back up what it is that I'm saying. Is this brand going to be able to see a return on investment with what it is that they are investing in? And that could be with conversion. That could be with brand awareness. Again, this depends on what's important for the brand. It's your job as the content creator to be asking these questions to figure that out, but making sure that you're executing on that promise that you're telling them. Mm, I love this. So many great pitching tips. And speaking of pitching, so assuming everybody does you know they take your course they listen to this podcast they start getting some offers then they're gonna have to negotiate right that's the next step and in your book you talk a lot about negotiation it's called get what you want it comes out in june why did you decide to write this book you know this book was something that had been i think in me for a while i didn't know how i would do it or when i would do it or what i would necessarily say but i always knew why um Obviously, being a book publicist, books, I've always loved books. I've always loved working with authors in that way. And I am a communicator at heart. That is my art form. It is the way that I connect with the world. I do that through speaking, just like you do on podcasts and on stages. And I do it through writing. And so it was, in some ways, it felt very natural to write a book because that is how I connect with people. And then in other ways, it was incredibly terrifying and scary to put yourself out there. It's, in in some ways, it's it's a lot easier just to kind of be a strategist and a marketer and kind of have the vault up when it comes to everything else. But to peel back the layers and to really show people more of my story and more of a side of me and most importantly I I felt like a lot of times when I would read books like this they would they would do a really good job at helping me align my goals with you know my purpose or my passion but a lot of times they didn't leave me feeling good about myself they actually left me feeling very overwhelmed like I wasn't doing enough and so I wanted just to bring a lot of worthiness into this book that you you really are enough as you are just in this moment and and that is enough to get what you want you there's just a, probably a couple of steps or some mindset stuff that we have to work through which we share in the book but it is possible I love that and I loved reading your book you gave me an advanced copy so um I hope you know we get to collaborate again when it comes out or something so I can give it a push for you when it's actually out um so let's talk about negotiation so what is your best tips in terms of setting a price when it comes to negotiation? And this is super interesting, especially when it comes to influencers, which I'd love for you to kind of take that angle because I think a lot of influencers don't understand how to price themselves. Yes. So, you know, I, I had to do an entire chapter on negotiation in the book because it's it's such a core element of my program, Pitch It Perfect, and just a core element in in my method of pitching and, and how I pitch. And it's probably the biggest takeaway, you know, 
over the last, since 2016, however many years, the thousands of students that have gone through the program, the biggest feedback that I hear is, Julie, you gave me the confidence to know my worth and to ask for what I wanted and to get it. And that really does stem from this art of negotiation. And for me, I think the most important piece when it comes to negotiate, negotiating, especially for influencers, is to remember that it's there's not a one size fits all. Um, the art of negotiation is super relative. There's a lot of factors mm-hmm. that go into it that are super unique to the deal that you are talking about, the, the, the scope of work, the terms, the licensing. I mean, there's so much that goes into that. But, but the, the, the key feedback that I can give anyone that's listening is that the biggest thing that I always tell people is never throw out a price. Because when you throw out a price you immediately lose any opportunity that you have of negotiating because you just showed all your cards. So Mm. I always recommend asking the brand what their rate is first, seeing what they come back with. And a lot of times I've had students that are like, Julie, I asked the brand what their rate was for this deal and they're paying me five times more than what I was gonna tell them that my rate was. Like it's, it's fascinating what can happen wow. when you throw that back on them because a lot of times we're undervaluing ourselves. You know, I always say to my students, whatever, whatever you think you need to charge, double it. <laughs> and I then we'll start role. from there. <laughs> yes, um, because someone can always say no or not now to you. But the biggest key, and I'll get back to, to my solution to that, but I, I wanna say this with negotiating. If you're throwing a number out and someone is immediately saying yes to you, you're undervaluing yourself and you're underpricing what it is. Mm. You sh- they sh- it should hurt them a little bit to say yes to the number that you're throwing out. You should, you should be negotiating the price. If they're just saying, yeah, no sweat, like it, you're undervaluing yourself. And so you want to get to a place where you're actually negotiating not only the price, but the terms and the deliverables and, and everything that's included in that. So it's mutually beneficial. So instead of throwing out a number, you wanna first ask them what what they're charging. If they don't give you that and they keep pushing back to you to give them a number, you don't give them a number, you give them a range. So, okay. Based off of what we've talked about and everything that you want me to do, it's going to cost between X and X. And then you leave it open. That's that's where you can start to negotiate. Because if they come back and they say, you know, okay, we want to give you $500 for this. It's like, well, actually, if all you have is $500, then I need to take X, Y, and Z off of this. Because I can't do all of this for $500. I can do all of it for $1,500. But I can't do all of it for 500 So you get to decide, Brand, what is it that you want? And again, it's the spotlight method. We're putting it back on them to have the, to have the opportunity to make their choice. And what mm. happens when people feel like they're in charge and when they feel like they're making the choices, it makes them feel good about the decision that they're making. So it's really about letting them decide. And it's like, you're still getting what you want because you're protected by the range that you threw out to them, but you're letting them decide where they want to meet you halfway. These are some really, really great tips. I think the other thing that I would add, especially for these niche micro influencers, don't forget if a brand is trying to specifically target the audience that you cater to. So let's say you're like an animal influencer and like all you do is talk about cats and dogs and all of your fans are animal lovers. You can charge like, 50x to the cat and dog brands out there whereas like some general car company that wants to sponsor you you're gonna have to be like standard rate but if it's like somebody who's actually trying to target your exact audience you can charge a lot lot more money because you have to think they're usually advertising to the two percent of the audience that might be interested in their brand not the hundred percent of the audience that is interested in their brand so that's the other thing i think people forget often Oh, there, there's so much power in the niche. And I think what you said, it's that it speaks volumes. It's so powerful. It's so important. And the data doesn't lie. It's like, you know, instead of targeting only 2% of your audience, you're going to be targeting 100% of your, of your ideal audience. And there's a lot of value to that. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so as we close out this interview, I'd love for you to share a transformational story of yours that I read in your book that I thought was really touching. Um, And it was about you hiding $30,000 of credit card debt from your husband, and it unlocked a toxic origin story for you about money and success. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I actually kick off the book with this story that I, I thought it was important 
to share it and put it in the book because I think it's so easy to see someone online or on social media that you start to like make up this fantasy about their life that like they make all this money and they have this and they have that but sometimes you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes and and for me what that looked like um because of my origin story of just having a very scarce mindset around money not understanding money not thinking that I was worthy of money I've always been really good at making money but I haven't been really good at budgeting the money and so what would happen for me is that I would get a bunch of money and then I would spend it as fast as I could make it and this really just comes from this core belief that I had that I wasn't worthy of the money and I think that happens a lot of time with women you'll either see women get it and spend it immediately or you'll see them get it and it's like they kind of just stockpile it like underneath the bed in the shoe <laughs> box because they're so afraid to to spend it at all and there's really a balance to me I really think now getting to the other side of all this money is really meant to be used and so at the time what was happening was that I was overspending money that I did not have I would make money and then I would spend that plus and over the course of about two-ish years, I amassed over $30,000 of credit card debt and I kept it hidden from my husband and we were in the process of refinancing a house. He found out and I had to really sit with a lot of just a lot of that stuff that was coming up. I couldn't deny it anymore. I couldn't be delusional about it anymore. I had to really face some hard truths about me and my relationship with money and my my relationship with being worthy of money and understanding money and I couldn't use that excuse of my origin story of oh I grew up and my parents didn't have a lot of money and you know I'm a financial toddler and I'm not good with math you know I couldn't use those excuses anymore to keep me from learning at least conceptually about about money if I wanted to have a business. And so what that looks like for me now is like I I have people on my team who I've learned a lot about money and I've learned where my strengths are with money and where my challenges are with money. And so I now I have people on my team that support me to make sure that I do understand and that I do budget and that I do streamline and that I do keep a profit first mindset and that I do pay myself first because that's really the whole point of, you know, having a business that thrives and making impact is like make sure that you pay yourself first so mm-hmm. you can have a life of abundance and so you can give back and you can you can keep this train running so that's kind of the gist of that and and you know the origin story behind that and just all of my limiting beliefs around money and it's still a work in progress i think it it was probably easy for me to feel like I had gotten really far from that but even now that I'm promoting the book and I'm talking about it like there's still things that come up that it's like you know I think I don't think that we're ever done growing and learning there's always going to be a next level and so I think this is something that a lot of women I know deal with and face and I mean Hollow, we've talked about it I mean you had that you know happen with you when you were first kind of starting out with figuring out how to make the money and how mm-hmm. to balance the money and all of that so I think it's a story that maybe not everyone's hiding <laughs> credit cards from their husband but <laughs> I think that they can relate to that fear and that shame around money yeah and I love how your book kind of walks every Everyone through a transformation they can make to become more successful in their lives and pitch themselves. And so I think a great way to kind of end this uh, before we go into the final questions of the show is talk to us about why you need to be your own main publicist. Why do you need to be your own publicist? Yeah, you know, I, talk, I call it BYOP, be your own publicist. And to me, um, it's it's really simple. And this just kind of comes back to a confidence piece that if If you're not going to toot your own horn, who is? You know, it really does have to begin with you. It has to begin with you advocating for yourself, saying what you want, um, saying what you want, saying what you need, meaning what you say um, with clarity, with confidence, with security, um, getting really clear about what is it that I want and being able to, to advocate for that. And I think that it from my experience, not only just being a publicist, but just through my own journey, it has to begin with you. Um, you know, most of most publicists that I know, it's like they, they can't even really do much for somebody if someone hasn't laid that foundation first for themselves and have really learned, especially in this day and age, Hala, like how to brand themselves, how Mm -hmm. to speak for themselves, how to be clear about their messaging, how to be clear about their marketing and how to promote themselves. And so that's really, I think, the important piece. And if anyone's having 
a tr- like any trouble with that, I would just encourage you to ask yourself, you know, why are you so afraid to be seen? You, you can't hide yourself and expect to be seen. So, you know, why are you so afraid to, to give yourself that gift of shining and, yeah. and see where that leads you? I love that. Well, this is such an awesome conversation. We always end the interview with a couple of questions that we ask all of our guests. The first one is, what is one actionable thing that our young and profiters can do today to be more profiting tomorrow? Hmm. I would say definitely keep a profit first mindset. So that means when you make money, you've got to pay yourself first. So getting clear on that, and that's going to keep that profit going. So remembering that paying yourself first is important. And what is your secret to profiting in life? And this could be anything. It could be financial, personal. Um, I think profiting in life is ease. The more ease that I have in my life, the more that I can just trust the process, the more that I can let go and the more ease that I allow into situations, to things, to my business, I feel like the more abundant and the more profitable it becomes. Mm, ease, I like that. Well, thank you so much, Julie. This was such a great conversation and congratulations on your new book. I'm gonna stick all your links in our show notes. Where can our listeners go learn more about you and everything that you do? So um, they can go to juliesolomon.net. That is my website. And on that website, you will find everything on how you can work with me from just amazing free content that I have. I I would love to share. I have a five-step guide on gaining clarity, building confidence, and achieving your goals. If you want to start there, you can go to juliesolomon.net slash clarity. It is a 45-minute audio guide with a downloadable worksheet that will kind of help you lay the foundation. I've got a ton of free stuff. My podcast, The Influence or podcast wherever you listen to podcasts I know that you guys are obviously podcast listeners so definitely check out the influencer podcast and then juliesolomon.net you'll also see the the pitch program there it's pitch it perfect is the name of the course and then I'm on Instagram so um, that's where I tend to spend most of my time so it's at Jules J-U-L-S Solomon S-O-L-O-M-O-N feel free to slide into my DMs I'm in there a lot my team's in there a lot that's where we really love to communicate with people. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team. As always, this is Hala signing off. <laughs>